On today's show, what is the fate of the X-Men movies at Disney? We have a trailer for Missing Link. Wait, let's talk about Disney some more. Are they going to make R-rated Marvel movies? This stuff's going to get crazy right now on Collider Movie Talk. So much to talk about with this. This sales call and then interviews and then producers speaking on behalf of other producers that they may have mentored. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a Collider Movie Talk episode. I cannot wait to get going on this one. There's going to be a lot of good conversation, not just because of the news, because of these two fine chaps we have. You guys know him as the corduroy jacketed, the man who has more Twitter <laughs> moments per capita than any. Online follow Mr. Jeffrey Snyder. How are oh, thank you, you? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little cold, which is why I got my jacket on. <laughs> it's, he's, he's, you look like you're dressed for <laughs> Adventure in the Missing Link right now. <laughs> the Like a Film we'll talk about shortly. And special guest joining us today from Collider Heroes on loan is Mr. Coy Jandrew. So excited, specifically for R rated Marvel news. The fates aligned. I'm here on the right day. Wasn't planned. I was going to say, we had you coming in at some point in the near future, which ended up being today because there's a movie we're going to talk about that you got a chance to screen mm -hmm. in a little bit. But then you have all this comic book movie news on top of it, and it's like, well, this is perfect. I walked in, I was like, oh, wait, news, news. Oh, I see. Okay, so this is why I'm here. I, I got to understand now. Yeah, there's been a bevy of news, and it all comes on the heels of today. Bob Iger had his sales call with a bunch of Disney high honchos, and they're just talking about how to make money in the year and how to spend it and what to do with future stuff. No Star Wars news was announced, although Twitter seemed to think that the episode nine title is going to drop today. So while we may not have that story for you yet, we have this very interesting interesting piece that comes from Christina Radish's interview, our own Christina Radish's interview, with Laura Shuler Donner. Now, uh, Miss Donner has been a producer forever in the world of movies, and she goes all the way back to the beginning with the X-Men films, as does her protege, Kevin Feige. She was talking recently about how the X-Men movies have the Dark Phoenix, they have New Mutants, and then who knows where Disney's going to take it. But from this interview, it seems like it is now clearly in Disney's hands as to what to do with the X-Men. Now, Donner pointed out that she thinks that there's a a lot of good stories to tell for movies like Cable, X-Force, and obviously the X-Men films we already have, but what is Disney going to do with them? Are they going to scrap it entirely? Are they going to try to evolve what we already have into some form, or are they just not going to worry about the X-Men, or Fantastic Four, or Deadpool, or Wolverine, or any of these things? So I tossed it to my two experts here. Coy, I know how much you love comic book movies. I know how excited you get. Hell, you sweat like the greatest of all the sweaties, Mr. John Schnapp, to go into a movie theater and watch a comic book movie. So what is your panic level today on the heels of this Donner quote, on the heels of Bob Iger's interview? Where are X-Men movies going? I think this is the best thing to happen to X-Men since X2. I think that Brian Singer made a bunch of very good mutant movies. I think we've yet to have a really good X-Men movie, and I think that's to come. I think we've seen a lot of adaptations, but never a literal translation. I think that where we are in society now with the culture of comic book films, we need a fresh start. We need things to start over, and I think the best way to do that is Kevin Feige plays the long game. X-Men are a very serialized character set. So you go Harry Potter, you build them up from the ground up, you have a core team of five or seven, you invest in all these characters we actually care about, and you actually get a real Cyclops, a real Storm, a real Gene. You give us the characters we loved as, as children, and then you actually play to the themes the comics are meant to, about racism, about homophobia, about all the things that are so important today. Like, the X-Men have never been more important. Every time, every ten years we think we've covered this, and then it's like, oh no, wait, we're still struggling with that very thing they identified in the 60s. So right now is an amazing time, because we can retell what the X-Men are meant to be. We do a fresh start, and we have a long-form storytelling with the medium that Kevin Feige does so well. Yeah, so Jeff, does it seem to you like Dark Phoenix, which is the movie that's coming out in June, or at least it, right now it's slated to come out in June, New Mutants on its heels in August. Are these just dead movies walking and we're going to forget about them or the cast as soon as they come out? I mean, I don't know if they're dead movies walking because, I don't know, they could be good. Maybe New Mutants turned out good. I don't know. I know nobody wants to believe that. Uh, and maybe New Mutants doesn't get a theatrical release. And the, and the rumors about it going to Hulu or Disney Plus later in the year turn out to be true. I don't have any inside information, uh, you know, one way or the other. I think that... They're dead. They're, they're dead movies in the sense that, yeah, you, once they get to one, uh, once Marvel gets its hands on the X Men, it's blowing. They're, they're blowing it all up. This cast is gone. This cast is ready to be gone, anyways. Like we, we, we I've seen enough of of McAvoy at this point as Professor X and and whatnot. Uh, I, I think that Coy is exactly right that that they need to start with five to seven characters. You know, uh, do that movie first and then expand it. The same the same way they did with the Avengers. That was that started out as five people in the first Avengers, and now there's sixty five characters in, in Endgame or whatever. Uh, so I think that 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 Kevin should follow his own playbook and just reinvent the wheel. And, and but you got to get them out 
out of Simon Kinberg's hands and, and even Lauren Schuler Donner. It was one of the things that Lauren Schuler Donner hit on multiple times during that interview when she was talking with Christina is that this is Kevin Feige's show now for the most part. And she did mention her and Feige have a good relationship. She was his mentor. But now that Kevin Feige is in control, let's talk about the evolution of X-Men and how best to approach it. Who's the first cog in that machine? Do you borrow somebody like a Deadpool who's a member of X-Force but also jokes around with the X-Men? Or is there one casting announcement of an X-Man, of an X-Person going forward that needs to happen? And then that is going to start the evolution. Is it a Professor X? Is it a Wolverine? Is it a Jean Grey? Who is it, Coy? I t honestly, I think it's Cyclops and Jean Grey. I'd focus on the youth. I'd focus on the love story between the two of them and make that your core. I'd, I wouldn't. Uh, we're kind of done with this Wolverine and the X Men, and that's what those Brian Singer movies were. We had a Wolverine plus team, and I think that announcing a Wolverine would be a misstep because we still love Hugh Jackman. We just had Wolverine and the X Men. I think you start with a core five or seven, and then in the second movie, you introduce that new team when they're trapped on an island, like a mutant island or something. Like you keep a Wolverine waiting in the wings for a little bit, he, and you tease the audience. He's a button, with that. or he's the second movie. He's not the first, and he's not not the major announcement because we're going to feel like it's the same mistakes being made all over again and we're not going to feel like that's our Harry Potter that's our reinvention that's our core team for one he should be older than the rest of the X-Men that should be a, that should be a benchmark you start from there I think these kids need to be kids so is the utilization of Wolverine going forward you think kind of like how the MCU right now utilizes Hulk where not necessarily fodder for your own movie but comes in and steals the show at points in other films unless he's Daphne Keen unless it's X-23 I think X-23 if you want to have a young current Wolverine you may Make it her. You have X-23, you have the legacy of Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, not in name, but like in concept, and you can blend her in because she's the right age for it, but I think that if you use Wolverine, it needs to be someone that tears through a scene and that isn't the main core part of the movie. So the evolution of the X-Men is one thing, Jeff, but it's also how do you introduce them in films? Do you just announce that there's going to be a standalone X-Men movie that's a reboot, or is there a way to more organically incorporate it into this larger universe you want? Basically what I'm asking is, are the X-Men going to start in the MCU right away, or are we going to have a sort of a standalone movie, a lot like what Marvel did with their Netflix shows where, hey, okay, that stuff happens, but we're not going to talk about that stuff. We're just going to have it as a headline on a wall somewhere. So do you just have an X-Men movie or do you throw them right into the Vitamix with the MCU? I think you just have an X-Men movie. In fact, I think the X-Men are the MCU going forward. Like, I don't know what happens to the Avengers after Endgame. Yeah, we're, we're not really sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I, don't, I don't know if you're going to have Captain America and Iron Man. I think that the, the X-Men are your new Avengers. Um, I I, I agree with you where you said that maybe wait un to bring in Wolverine, or I could see him maybe not waiting until a second film, but waiting until the end of the first film. But I still think that that is the crucial casting along with Professor X. I don't think it's about Cyclops or Jean Grey. I, I don't think that love, like Kevin Feige, his, his love and romance has not been his strong suit I think in the MCU. When you look at uh, Thor and Natalie Portman, or even Pepper uh, and, and Iron Man, who's the other one? Um, uh, Captain America's love interest, who I never ca never cared about it. Yeah, all. Occasionally, you had you know yeah, some just, people making eyes at Black Widow going back and forth. Never really worked out with Captain America. They took a nice road trip to New Hulk, Jersey. That was a choice. The Hulk. That's going to be interesting issues <laughs> in the bedroom with the heart rate scenario. So a lot of hurdles for these superheroes. But it seems like the X Men are able to navigate those pretty well. Uh, yeah, Listen, I've always been an X-Men fan. I, I've always liked this franchise, even though it has been one of diminishing returns. And I'm definitely nervous about Dark Phoenix based on what I've heard. Uh, but I still have faith because I, I do just like, I, I like the X-Men more than I do the Avengers in terms of what they're all about and who the characters okay, are. Okay, so as an X-Men fan, do you agree with Corey that you start Wolverine at a, at a later age in his life because he, he's lived, or do you try to go with the younger Wolverine you just to. because, look, you do have to it, it give some sort of concession to the fans that have grown up seeing Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. They've seen him matriculate in one, so why wouldn't they be able to get to watch him matriculate in another? Uh, from from a character perspective, I can't speak to it, which would be better for. But purely based on logistics, from an actor perspective, you have to go young with it, just so that the part can age with an actor. Going young here, going maybe a little bit older here with the. Logan he was in World War Two with with Cap. Like in my experience of Wolverine, when I think about Wolverine, he's someone that's seen a hundred years more than even Professor Xavier. Could he's he someone be? That, could he have actually fought with Cap? Well, like with the current did? MCU. I mean, I know in the comic books he did, but but can we can we revisit that history from Captain America? 
America, the first Avenger, and say, oh, you, you, wait, you remember M M M Logan? Remember James Howlett the guy? from that time? <laughs> yeah, he just shamelessly pander. Remember like, that really hairy guy? Really short, angry all the time, said bubble <laughs> lot. We're not sure why. And then now he's here. I, Look at him go. I, guys, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> That's why I'm just going like this to the camera. You've lost me. This has become a hero's conversation. <laughs> well, it's because Logan is a character that has a history fighting in wars, and he's a lot older than any of the other X-Men, so sure. could that be the link into the MCU? Because Kevin Feige, he knows who's popular, and he knows the Wolverine is the most, arguably the most popular X-Men of all time, possibly with Deadpool now thrown in there, too. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, Corey, just, and Jeff, too, as somebody who's, does this... What does this do when you go into the theater to watch Dark Phoenix? Like, are you even looking for, like, ooh, how are they going to continue the storyline? Or is it you're just going to see one episode of an X-Men show, and then you're leaving and never thinking about it It's again? The, definitely the, the finale. It's the denouement. Den yes. I, I think it's it. fitting that the swan song is Phoenix. I think it's really fitting yes. that the end of an era is a story they tried to tell three times. I think <laughs> X2 setting something up that then didn't land with X3, and then now might not land with Dark Phoenix. I hope this is really good. I just think it's a really interesting thing that the our last movie is the one they keep being like maybe today <laughs> everyone's ready to go jennifer lawrence is ready to go everybody's checked out pretty she's much. been ready to go for about a movie and a half now yeah did you try to pronounce denouement say denouement yeah okay i did think it's denouement that's how i was taught it uh, it's french right hey, denouement? I think it's tomato i think it's tomato denouement. okay last question before i move on because this is something that i posited on collider live this morning you guys can check out with john claude van damme i'm not asking van damme <laughs> about this because we're talking about a lot of other things with him but the question is so the introduction of the x-men into the mc when it finally happens now all these quotes these indications Iger's phone call today we got our Fox properties. They're going to be in one house. We can start to incorporate them in movies going forward, maybe not today, but very soon. Is there a chance that the X-Men are teased or introduced in a post credit scene in an MCU movie that's coming up, possibly one that's opening as early as late April? I think that's the move. I think you end with a post credit scene, introduce where your universe goes. I think you've already, you have an ending of a universe of Endgame. You have something that concludes, if I were in control and my crazy interdimensional theory lands, if they're in a new dimension where mutants already exist, then that's how you introduce it. And then you have these kids getting their X-Gene powers activated. You have this whole new world launched from the end of another one. And then Endgame doesn't hurt as bad because we have now, we have hope. We have a new hope. And things can go forward. And I really think that's what the X-Men can represent. And I also think that what Feige is going to present going forward needs to be strong enough to be like, okay, phase one through three are over. We still have this. Momentum isn't going to stop. And X-Men's a great indicator of that. And Jeff, it feels like they're going to have enough momentum that they don't have to do that if they don't want to because Avengers Endgame, I almost think the Russo brothers want to make a movie and, and say this is the end. Yes. Of, uh, this is the culmination. And when you answer. have the culmination the end, you don't really want to do a post credits scene, Yes, right? you stole my answer, Alex. <laughs> I, I don't think that there should be a mid-credit or post credit credit sequence at the end of Endgame. I think the movie should speak for itself. That's the end. Now we're moving on to what's next. You don't have to keep teasing things. There's <laughs> This is a natural ending. <laughs> You know, like, I just, I, I, I don't get why there's this rule that Marvel need, movies need that. I, I think it would actually be really nice to just end it with that with, with the credits, and, and that's it. And you were not a big fan of Infinity Wars, so maybe you're no. looking for more death and destruction in this one? Are I'm, you looking for characters just to be wrecked left and right? Do you want to see some, yes, yes. some hope? Yes, I, yes. I want just something satisfying, because the end of Infinity War, I know everyone loves the snap, wasn't satisfying to me. That's half a movie. I, you know, if I didn't pay to see the movie, but if I had paid, I would have <laughs> felt like I just got half a movie. Okay. All right. Very, very good stuff. And uh, we're happy to have Jeff here for a little while before he has to go to his prize fight at the MGM tonight wearing that coat. I do want to stay on the subject of Disney and making movies in the Marvel Universe going forward because Bob Iger, as I mentioned, the CEO, had a sales call today and via an article in Variety, the topic of R-rated films under the Disney umbrella was broached. And Bob Iger said that we will continue in that business, referring to R-rated Deadpool movies, the more adult-oriented Marvel adventures, saying there's certainly popularity of those type of films. He hinted that the films won't be released under the traditional Marvel or Disney banner, so you're not going to see, you know, <laughs> Disneyland with the fireworks going off, and then Deadpool, you know, dropping F-bombs left and right, but it does look like we're going to get R-rated Deadpool movies. Jeff, this is something that we had assumed, um, for the most part going forward, that they would drop the Disney logo from that to create brand separation, but Disney is also in the business of not just entertaining the kiddies, they're in the business of making money. Deadpool and more adult-oriented comic book films can do that. 
Yeah, I, I think that Disney's going to hang on to the Fox labels. They didn't buy the studio just to to get their hands on IP. You know, they have plenty of IP. I think that they're you know they have to acknowledge that they're buying a legacy uh, and and. You know, Deadpool has been so successful for Fox. I don't know why you'd mess with a good thing. You know, just because there's a studio mandate to make family-friendly movies or PG-13 and below. Uh, I don't think you know De- Deadpool is a cash cow. You got to squeeze that un- until it's basically time to stop making Deadpool movies, whenever that is. Uh, and-, and they should go out as R, and they should go out under the Fox banner. Corey, while everybody's waiting for the new shipment of comic books to come in tomorrow with their local comic book shop, is everybody just breathing a sigh of relief right now? Comicdom was worried about this move. I hadn't been worried personally because I know that people look at dollar signs before they look at ratings. And right. Deadpool 1 and 2 are now the number one and two highest rated X-Men films. They trounced all the PG-13. So there was concern, but I think it was people that just looked at Disney as an empire, not as a business. And this is great for Predator and Alien and everything else under the Fox umbrella that I had assumed was fine. But but there was, I mean, there was concern, but I, I never felt like it was really founded in reality. I think it was just founded in fear. Uh, the monopoly is more concerning, I think, than the R-rated aspect, and I, I don't think that's being touched upon as much. People have been afraid of, like, this boogeyman that didn't exist yet. I feel like I'm, I'm just in the minority here when I'm talking about Deadpool being eventually incorporated into a PG-13 X-Men movie. I don't have any issue with it. I think it's going to be very easy to do. I think Deadpool, the character, would be sarcastic and approach that with the, what the F, and then they bleep him, and then we make fun of the bleep and all that stuff. But is there something else that I'm missing? Is to why we can't have Deadpool in because the X-Men movie is going to be PG-13 mm-hmm. going forward it, unless it is like another you know, standalone like Logan if it's made by Fox or by Disney whoever the banner is it's going to be PG-13 movies I think you can still incorporate Deadpool in there I, I think you can too he doesn't need to be dropping F-bombs left and right and, and the level of violence doesn't need to be the same as it is in the Deadpool movies I was just going to say I think that the rating system itself is totally outdated uh, I, I don't think that it's very helpful to anybody at this point and I, I absolutely see it being overhauled within the next five years do you really the the yeah. whole mpaa giving a rating how would they overhaul it what would the jeff snyder model be i, I just I, I don't think pg-13 works anymore i think that 13 year olds just given you know their their access to the internet in this world at their fingertips like i feel like they're a little bit more mature than, than i was at 13 or, or less innocent so to speak i don't know maybe they need to institute a 15 rating that kind of thing instead of it you know an r being 17 maybe they move down to 15 like it is i think in the uk right Either I think the they have 15, Canada, 15 15 or 16. They have, have some not special been, I rating. John Roke and Matt yeah, Nose. I, I don't know, but I, I just think, I don't know, if I was a parent, I, I wouldn't care so much what a movie is rated. I know what is appropriate or not appropriate for my kid. I don't need a, a letter from an anonymous group you know, we, that we don't know how they were really arrived on. I, I don't need that to guide my decisions. Yes, but you and I have both said enough things on this show to indicate that we're probably not going to be parents anytime soon. Definitely not. <laughs> oh, fingers, Andrew, I'm not sure how crossed. many little ones you have running around. I don't, I don't imagine that there's any to claim in the near future, but as far as the R-rated PG-13 stuff goes, this is a pretty easy melding because Deadpool... Can't, he, all, he doesn't have to say the F-bomb. He just has to want to say the F-word. To me, the X-Force X-Men line is stronger than the Deadpool X-Men line. X-Force, what separates them from the X-Men is the violence, is they'll do the things the X-Men won't do. So to me, the X-Force world needs to be rated R. But Deadpool and an X-Men? Absolutely. Because what is funny is censorship sometimes. And what's funny is what you can't see. And what's funny is what you avoid. If they do like the Kuzco pause thing and Emperor's New Groove and make Deadpool aware he's in a movie or in a comic or whatever they want to do, you have your cake and eat it too because the fourth wall break is what makes Deadpool so great so if you're aware that he can't be himself then the audience that's on both sides of that win they're aware of deadpool as a radar character and they're aware that like x-men get to have him so i don't however think deadpool is the way to reboot the x-men i don't i think colossus and the way they did the soft reboot is going to be great but i think if you incorporate deadpool too early that's going to throw off your tone of your x-men i think the x-men should live on their own for a little bit before deadpool comes to play yeah deadpool's uh, calling card is breaking the fourth wall our calling card here on movie talk when jeff snyder leans into somebody else's shot to put his water down <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I want to remind you guys that we had a special on Sundance Films this morning. It was the Sundance Film Festival wrap-up with Perrin Emeroff and Scott freaking Mance. They were both in studio live this morning at 9 a.m. to talk about all the films they saw at Sundance, what's getting bought, what's getting distributed, what are they like, what were they disappointed by. You can check that out. It's up on Collider Live right now. And a new Rule of Two podcast with Mark Riley and Mark Fernandez is dropping soon. They take one topic in Star Wars and have a long, interesting conversation about it. I'm not sure if the title is going to factor into that convo yet, but it probably will shortly. 
shortly. And before we move on to our next story, which is the Missing Link trailer, Coy, you got a chance to go uh, check out Velvet Buzzsaw at an early screening, the Netflix movie with Jake Gyllenhaal. And this movie, the trailer seemed to be very divisive online. And I was just curious because it feels like you and Jeff Snyder, who have both seen it, have divisive opinions as well. So I had a really great time because the movie, I think, is, is to be experienced with people and this is coming to my tricky thing with Netflix. Netflix takes really bold choices. They take risks. They make weird art. They make actual art. But with the Netflix model, they only have a screening or two or it's released in these small little runs. And I got to see the premiere with a full live audience and the audience was uproarious. They were laughing. They were cackling. They were uncomfortable. And that really sold my experience in the movie because the movie is uncomfortable. The whole thing is a strange art house film. So if you remove that, I think a lot of the people that aren't enjoying it as much as home, it's because of the actual theatrical experience. So it's a dark comedy it's in, in a, essence. Yeah, very dark. Pitch but black comedy. still different in tone from Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler was to me a commentary on a completely non-funny thing. Whereas this is a commentary on a very funny thing if you're watching it from the outside. Because art's killing. Art I, is basically murder. It, it's a it's a Goosebumps meet Chuck Palahniuk plot. It's, it's a very, you know, that through line and storyline and for me as soon as I accepted that was the movie I was in I really liked the shocky C-list horror and the comedy I thought was so satirical that it either really worked for you and you were laughing with the audience or you weren't and I think it didn't land for a lot of people but the, the other thing I really enjoyed was Netflix built that art world for the after party so as soon as you were at the after party you were looking at the art you've been watching the whole movie you were having the same conversations you were drinking wine and feeling just as awful and smarmy but it was intentional and then to see all the people like milling about and trying to have conversations everything felt like life imitating art which was in itself a commentary on the movie so netflix built this perfect little microcosm of the world they built for us to laugh at and so then to be living in it it just kept that building. onion so I really liked it. I thought the satire was really multifaceted. I thought the performances were all incredible. Nightcrawler was my favorite movie that year, so I had really high expectations. I laughed more in this than I have in most linear comedies, but I'm not sure if that's going to keep applying without a theatrical experience. So I think the theater is really important. Okay, Jeff, uh, Corey has me sold. I'm about to hit the button on Netflix unless you tell me otherwise. Yeah, I was I was disappointed by this one. I stayed up late on uh, on Thursday night because uh, the movie hit Netflix at midnight Friday morning. Um, so I, I, I stayed up till 2 in the morning watching it I was let down I thought the movie functioned better as a satire of the art world than as a horror movie which was kind of what I was expecting was a horror movie I didn't think that it was scary I thought that it was very PG-13 um, Jake Gyllenhaal kind of just playing a weirdo and, and as much as I love that uh, it, it, the character just didn't really do much for me it is more of an ensemble piece which, which uh, Dan Gilroy had indicated he'd sort of said that it was like his version of the player in the art world um, yeah I know you're a big Gyllenhaal guy so I it love him more than anything, and, and, I, and like Coy, Nightcrawler was my favorite movie of 2014, but between this movie and Roman J. Israel, I feel like Gilroy just likes mashing up these genres that don't necessarily go together, um, and, and th this was certainly an ambitious film. Uh, I just don't think that he stuck the landing. All right. Well, I have yet to check it out, but I will as well as I'm sure a lot of you will maybe this weekend, maybe tonight, and hopefully we can do a review on Schmo sometime in the near future. In the meantime, April 12th, it's a big day for a lot of reasons. One, I'm doing stand-up in Chicago. You can get tickets right now at markellislive.com. It's starting Star Wars <laughs> Celebration, 7 p.m., 10 p.m., Reggie's Rock Club. It's a great hallowed rock venue. We're doing stand-up that night. Hope you guys can come check it out if you're going to be in the Chicago area for Star Wars Celebration or you happen to live in Chicago. And April 12th is also the day that The Missing Link is released in theater. Is the new Leica film. It stars Zach Galifianakis and Hugh Jackman. Not their bodies, but their vocal talents. They are animated over it, and Zach Galifianakis is the voice of a missing Link-like character who wants to find his family. So who do you recruit to find your family? A furious explorer like Hugh Jackman. It's got a great vocal cast, a lot of talent in this movie. I saw the first trailer, really dug it, and this trailer, gotta tell you, Coy, no different. I am in on the missing link. I like everything that Leica is doing right now, including this latest trailer. How about yourself? I like how warm Leica films are. I like how when you watch your trailer you feel like you're in the universe and you feel encompassed and everything feels like your childhood I really like that it feels like a pop-up book when you were a kid so <laughs> I, I love that Sasquatch and Yeti and that whole subcurrent that strange like counterculture of that world is getting a movie because it's really popular whenever you like dive into the weird Yeti culture that that is a world so getting a kid's adaptation of that I think is great I love the voice cast I think everything about it is a sell and I really want more movies like this to exist because I don't want everything to be a franchise I don't want everything to be a, a comic property I don't want 
every kid's movie to have an IP that they already know for 10 years. I think taking a chance like this is a really good opportunity for Leica and for animation and for bold chances, so I hope it does well. Yeah, Jeff, I like the look of the animation here. As Corey indicated, it's very warm looking, but it also, I like the character design of Zach Galifianakis' missing link. Are you in on this? You're sometimes iffy on animated property, so we, Corey and I want to get you to the theater as well. I'm afraid I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like the animation style. I, I like the animation style for Kubo as well, but that wasn't a movie I saw in theaters. That was a movie I, I waited for for uh, home video. Um, like it just, they haven't hit a home run to me. I think part of it is their their actual stories and what these movies are about. This movie about Bigfoot, a Yeti, whatever it is, wasn't it made a few months ago? Wasn't it called Smallfoot? We did <laughs> like, have it, was, it was the oh, exact yeah, same thing, foot. except except it's inverse. So in Smallfoot, he gets banished, and in this movie, Bigfoot's trying to get back to his family. You know, so. Uh, I just don't know what they're thinking with this. I you think seem it, like you're still you're still frostbitten <laughs> by a small foot. Did you, did I, you I didn't, I didn't go see, see small foot either. I, I, again, I, I don't go see a lot of animated movies, um, but the ones that I do see look better than this one. Well, you have a lot in your schedule. You're going to Studio 54 tonight with that jacket. Yeah, exactly. So. Look That's where he keeps that. his moments. <laughs> I don't know. Like yeah, the, the voice cast, it, it's intriguing. Um, Hugh Jackman, Zoe Saldana, Galifianakis, Timothy Oliphant, but. Yeah, it's just not enough here. I'm it, not buying a ticket to this. It is an ants bug life situation I hadn't put together that we did just have. Like this is Deep Impact Armageddon. This right, is exa- this is Shark exactly. Tale Finding Nemo all over again. Which I Columbus saw movie Nemo. do I see in 1992? <laughs> Which mm. one do I dive into? Yeah. But I think it looks. good. I mean, I, I see what you're saying. I just I think bold animation is a really uphill battle that in this case hasn't won. And I, pu- I like pulling for, for Leica for whatever reason. Again, they, they're probably owned by some mustache trolling billionaire, but <laughs> I just feel like it's it's not an answer because I really enjoy Pixar and, and Disney animated movies for the most part, too. I like what Illumination does most of the time, but it's nice to have another what player in the game and the stop motion that Leica does. That animation style going as far back as something like like a Paranorman is something I really had a great time oh, yeah, watching. Yeah, Coraline so. looked gorgeous. They, they make gorgeous looking movies. I just don't think any of like Pe- Coraline, Paranorman, those are two and a half star movies out of four for me. What was the other one? The Box Trolls? I didn't bother to see that. And then, and then Kubo, w- I think. And Kubo. Kubo was their best one, and I'd be very surprised if Missing Link was better than Kubo. Uh, this one is written and directed by Chris Butler, who also uh, did the same for Paranorman, in case you are a fan of Paranorman. So the movie comes out once again April 12th, while I'll be in Chicago on stage. And then the movie's going to continue to play in theaters, and I'm probably going to go home and get some Lumanati's deep dish pizza. They followed me on Twitter, by the way. I got, I got two deep dish followers on Twitter yes. from Chicago. So You're ready. I'm a thin like crust king. guy. Oh, I, I mean, thin, for health reasons, yes. But if <laughs> but I'm going Chicago to Chicago, reasons, right. I just want to die. I, you can tie my hands behind my back, and I will go face first <laughs> into a deep dish pizza. I'll let you guys know about the results. One more story to get to, and then we'll take your live Twitter question. Sure, there's a lot to talk about today, so go ahead and start tweeting us at Collider Video. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. Our last story, Billy Eichner is set to write and star in a new romantic comedy from Universal Pictures that's going to be a collaboration between Judd Apatow and Nicholas Stoller. So Judd Apatow is going to produce it, Nicholas Stoller is going to direct it. Now, Stoller has just worked with Billy Eichner on the Netflix series Friends from College, and before that, I think Eichner made a small cameo in Neighbors 2. So they clearly have a rapport. What's interesting about this story is that this film is going to follow two men who have commitment problems in a relationship together, and they're working on it and through it. So, Jeff Snyder, we were talking about this before we went to camera. This is going to be one of the first, if not the first, um, with romantic comedy starring two gay men who are just trying to have those same relationship struggles and trying to get through them like a Matthew McConaughey, Kate Hudson would back in the day. Yeah, exactly. I, I was delighted by this news. I'm a huge Billy Eichner fan. I love Billy on the street. I loved, I see, I saw every episode of Difficult People, which was canceled too soon. Uh, when I did the list of who should host the Oscars uh, in late December, I put Billy Eichner on that list and I, and I paired him with someone who I think is just perceived as super hetero in, in John Cena. I, I would have loved <laughs> Bill, Bill Eichner, Billy Eichner and John Cena to host the Oscars for sure. Um, I, I Listen, Judd Apatow is the man. I, I, I love what Judd does. I love who he chooses to shine a spotlight on. Billy Eichner has been waiting for this opportunity for a long time. I think that he's earned it. I it felt maybe more groundbreaking to me than, than other people. You know, the, uh, I had mentioned, you know, the Birdcage and In and Out. Those are classic gay comedies, but they're not rom coms. Someone, you know, people are saying that Love Simon is is a gay rom com, but if he's trying to hide the fact that he's gay and, and the romantic interest is is you know a, uh, an, an online pen pal, who well, it's we don't through a computer the, as opposed yeah, to we, working on it in person. But right, it, it's like okay, that counts, but it doesn't. It, it's it's an 
unconventional rom-com by any definition. I think it's, still in, definition. I think it's still in the ballpark. Fair enough. Either way, I think the idea that, that we're going to see Billy Eigner, you know, in what is most likely going to be an R-rated comedy and that is going to deal, frankly, with, with gay sex, I think. We, you know, Love, Simon was a largely sexless movie since it's set in high school. I think that that's exciting, and I really like Nick Stoller as the, the director to bring that to theaters. I love Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Um, yeah, this is a great team. Yeah, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, is it holds up through the test of uh, the, the 10-year window for comedies. Corey, to me, this sounds like a Billy Eichner's train wreck, where it's going to be, look, we're going to get raunchy, we're going to be R-rated, we're going to have a lot of fun with relationships, and the team he's got behind the camera, like Jeff indicated, pretty solid bunch. I think this is a really good opportunity for the world to know Billy Eichner. I feel like he's one of those niche comedians that people are like, oh, that guy, and he's not fully as there. As soon as so you see him talk, you're like, you oh, I, the, the man on the street. I guy. like the yelly guy. So I think I agree with train wreck, where it's going to be the yelly guy gets his comeuppance, and I'm really excited for that, because I think he's incredibly talented. I do agree that we've had a lot of romantic gay comedies of the last few years, but none that have felt as completely normalized as this, because like you said, Love, Simon was more of a third act thing, and it was in the trailer, but I want it to just be a rom-com movie where the two characters are gay. And we were talking about right before air how Brokeback was only 12 years ago. And I really want to take a moment to just appreciate the fact that in 12 years, that movie was so controversial, that caused so much of an uproar, Westboro Baptist Church Madness, all of that stuff, and now this is a a breakdown where it's a movie that's just going to exist. And I'm so excited for it to be just a normal rom-com movie that just has two men in it. And I think it's a really good opportunity for the gay community to have a movie to look to and be like, that's when it started. This is a comedy and this is ours and we can embrace it and it's for us. And I'm, I, Billy Eckner's, I think, a great And the fact that Billy Eckner is himself an outspoken uh, gay man, I think it's, it, this, this becomes a very problematic movie if it's two straight men who are playing two gay men. Now, I don't know who they're right. going to cast opposite him, but I think the Billy Eckner th- is the most important factor in this. Nicholas Thor's great. Judd Apatow's great. Mm-hmm. The fact that Billy Eckner mm-hmm. is writing Right. And starring exactly. in this movie, I, I think that's the crux of what we're talking about here as far as having progress going forward and letting people tell their stories as opposed to having what you traditionally would have had somebody try to interpret somebody else's right. reality. Right, and it's similar to what Judd did with Amy Schumer and what he's doing now with Pete Davidson where they're writing their own vehicles. Like he, They know their strengths and weaknesses. They know what they have wanted to see out of a, a gay rom-com or, or what they don't want to see. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think that this bodes really well. And, and, and Universal has always been really strong strong at making comedies. I think that they are the best studio right now at, at churning out, you know, really hilarious movies. Um, so I think that this project is at the, at the right home, too. They also right uh, home, right time. make dinosaur movies. Universal does, so... <laughs> More on that. Maybe there'll be a dinosaur in this movie. Who knows? As a gay developed. dinosaur. But, well, there might be one in the missing link. So there could be a lot of... We actually might have reported on a lot of dinosaur news. We just don't know. I want to remind you guys that today is Tuesday. So we got two more days of movie talk left. Tune into tomorrow's movie talk because there's going to be a special about, an announcement about movie talk. We also have Collider live tomorrow at 10 a.m. It's five days a week now. And you also have Collider Heroes. So, Coy, you're just going to spend the night... Just grab a cot. <laughs> just get cozy. Get Think about the, the X-Men. Uh, I'll rate a Deadpool gets to live on to keep me warm. <laughs> There's going to be no shortage of topics to talk about on tomorrow's Collider Heroes, I am sure. So check that out with Coy and Amy. Now we move on to live Twitter questions, and we have some good ones. Kicking us off is one of our favorites. Attenda Banerjee says, what's your favorite documentary about filmmaking? His is a tie between The Death of Superman Lives from our buddy, the late great John Schnepp, and Waking Sleeping Beauty. Your favorite documentary about Filmmaking. I will echo uh, Mr. Banerjee's uh, nominations. I'm also going to say that I, I, the title of it escapes me, but there is a fantastic documentary that's almost as good as the movie itself about the making of Jaws mm. and going behind the scenes and seeing just how much they had to go through. It's the shark won't work. We're on the high seas. The weather's not right. Bob Shaw had a drink. There's so many things going on with the, the making of that film. And for a young filmmaker like Steven Spielberg, who's worried about budgetary concerns, and he's not Spielberg we know now he's just this guy who made Duel and I guess he's the guy from Sugarland Express going to try to make a movie now and how they pulled it off it really makes you marvel even more at the feat that is 1975's Jaws so that's what I'll toss your way you guys got any suggestions uh, Lost in La Mancha um, I want to say the the one about the filming of uh, Dr. Moreau, the the island Dr. Moreau, the insanity of dealing with like an insane coked out like oh Marlon uh, Brando, yeah, and Brando's yeah. just out of his mind, and they're just trying to like cope with him. Uh, I think La Mancha is about um, 
Terry Gilliam trying to get uh, the the one he's been making for the last 25 years. Don Quixote. Uh, right? Yeah, Don Quixote. Yeah, the, the the attempt at Don Quixote for the 32nd time. Uh, and then there's a, an amazing. It's it's film adjacent. There's an amazing documentary about Ralph Steadman and Hunter S. Thompson that dives into the making of uh, Fear and Loathing, which is just incredible mm-hmm. because Hunter S. Thompson's process is something I don't recommend for anyone, but you should research it and not do it. It's a very it's, involved process. It's a lot. It's a lot, but it's important. <laughs> uh, Jeff Snyder, you got any good documentaries about the artifact? Yeah, I don't actually. Why I haven't seen a lot of the major documentaries in this sort of subgenre, but I, I did like Overnight uh, about Troy Duffy, the director of the Boondock Saints, mm-hmm. and uh, and his you know obstacles finishing that movie with Harvey Weinstein looming over him, and also uh, the fan movie Raiders, the the story of the greatest fan film ever made about the kids who were remaking uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, shot for shot, it took like decades for them to pull it off. Uh, yeah, that 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 really showed to me the joys of filmmaking. But yeah, actually, you know what? The one that just came to mind, Spielberg. That's not about the making of a film but the, the Spielberg the documentary, documentary I thought is incredible it was pretty good yeah a nice examination of his life and what he was going through personally at the time he was making some of his best known work so I would recommend that one in concert with the Jaws documentary Jaws documentary is so good all right moving on to uh, two point the tax man this is Tyler Koba asks do you see Marvel and Star Wars having a presence at San Diego Comic-Con you can maybe get a phase four preview for Marvel at Comic-Con. So if my math is correct, and I'm trying to uh, usher in my memory with every fiber of my being, I think the D23 might be this summer, or was it the last summer? Got to work on that one. I think it's this summer. Yeah, I don't think we had one last year, so I, I think, think it's this year. Due. That's right. We did not have a D23 in between Infinity War, and so I think we're due for, because a lot of times, D23 is basically like Disney's convention where they have a lot of cool theme park stuff, but they make big announcements, and it's a lot like when you get your announcements at San Diego Comic-Con, you're in Hall H, you're in this giant room with tons of fans, and they have this great presentation. That's when they brought out the last time everybody who was involved, or most people who were involved with the making of Infinity War, they showed Infinity War footage months before anybody else sees. You saw the shot of Thanos throwing a freaking moon at people, and it was mind-blowing. So you're probably going to get something like that for D23, as opposed to at San Diego Comic-Con. I'd probably say that, look, Star Wars Celebration is, in all likelihood, going to be our first peek at Mm -hmm. footage from Episode Nine, and then maybe additionally you get something at D23. So I don't see either one having a big presence at San Diego Comic-Con. You guys? I agree. I, I just feel like that more and more they're withdrawing from that convention. I feel like more and more when they're taking over their own. Why? Why would they share the the spoils of war? You know, they've done all these things and they've built their own conventions. And I don't see them. Hall H is not very Marvel lately. And I also personally, I'd rather not see a giant announcement for what their next wave is going to be. Endgame will have just come out in April. I don't want to see what the next few years are going to be if I've just recovered from losing all my heroes. Yeah, as far as Marvel goes, I'm not sure I want to see any announcements at Comic-Con or D23. I actually really liked when Marvel sort of assembled a whole bunch of L.A. press at the Chinese Theater, and that's what they, where they brought out Chadwick Boseman mm-hmm. as Black Panther for they the first time. They announced and they had Downey and, and Chris Evans. Yeah, yeah, like, I, yeah. I thought that event went really well. Um, Star Wars is different, though, and I understand you're, you're absolutely right. Disney has been pulling out of Comic-Con and refocusing its assets more on, on D23, but I don't know that you can just leave Comic-Con hanging with Star Wars uh, coming out in December. I think that they're coming off a rough patch with Solo. I think that they owe something mm-hmm. to those fans. And I, and I this is just a hunch because I've never been to Comic-Con and, and really have no desire You've to go. You've never been to Comic-Con. I've never wow. been. Don't really want to go. I have a feeling I'm going to end up there this year. But, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, you sound uh, thrilled about I, that. I, I think that, that Disney. People up. literally wait online. They wait. Wait in to see things. me. I will, I will Thousands sign Thousands of dollars autographs. spent. I feel like I'm going to go. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think that you will see something from Star Wars at Comic-Con. I, I can't imagine Disney l- you know, letting all those fans go home empty in. Well, the one thing I will say is that I think that Comic-Con presents an opportunity, even for a huge conglomerate like Disney, to... Right, they don't have to make any announcements there because they have their own stuff they can make their announcements at, but it makes it a little competitive and you're getting in the ring with other studios and so if Disney did come down with a big Avengers announcement or a big X-Men or a Star Wars announcement you put that against whatever DC wants to bring whatever Universal Lionsgate whoever else wants to bring something you say oh we made the biggest news splash that day that's something to take with you and that's a feather in your cap I don't know that Star Wars or particularly the MCU need that but maybe that's part of Disney's logic so we'll have to wait and see as we get closer to the summer with San Diego Comic Con coming in July Uh, Matthew Spencer's up next and he says, in honor of Mark Ellis's, Josh McCougan, Ken Knapsack's road trip, we did stand up in uh, Arizona this past week. It was great. Six hours in the car each way with those two guys. A lot of beef jerky was consumed. Matthew says, name a supervillain you would like to go on a road trip with. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the heroes who's first villain. that you want to go super on a road villain. trip with. Uh, you know, I feel like Mojo would know the best radio stations, uh, <laughs> being that he's an entertainment man. Uh, I also think Apocalypse would be... I, I, my brain's on X-Men because of where we are, but Apocalypse and Mojo are two of the, uh, two of the ones up there. But I feel like the most interesting conversationalist would be Lex Luthor. I feel like I'd learn a lot. Yeah, Lex Luthor. I mean, you're also, you got to remember, you're on a road trip, and so you're probably going to be crashing with this person at a hotel. So Hannibal Lecter's out. I want to wake no, up. No Lecter for me. I'm, I'm not going to go with a very well-known comic book villain, but I'm going with T-Bird from The Crow because he's got that awesome car, and I like his music. You know, they're listening to Stone Temple Pilots Mature. at one point. Yes. He's like, pick up some road beers, and I don't know. I, I like T-Bird, the guy Fire from, it up. The, guy from the Warriors. It up. Yes. I love The Crow. I'm going, uh, I'm going Loki. <laughs> Because, because I, don't th- I don't feel like my life is in danger with Loki. I feel like he, he might steal my credit card and, and put gas in the car with my money or go get some pork rinds with some cash I left laying around. But I, I, don't, think, I don't feel like my life is, is in peril because Loki's there. You know, you may wake up in the hotel and maybe he stole your car the next day. But I think for that road trip, it might even be worth it because hanging out with Loki for a day seems like pretty cool. And let's face it, the, guy, the guy's popular when you go to nightclubs. So probably make a lot of new friends that evening. Yeah, probably. You don't you have go. a problem making friends, Mark Ellis. Uh, I'm a little shy when I'm not in front of these white hot spotlight cameras. Ooh. One more question we're going to call today, and All it right. comes from Broom Kid. Well, sorry, Broom Kid, we did not get a name for your movie where you're probably going to be in college in outer space later on this year. But he has a good question. Why aren't coffee and donuts a staple of movie theater concessions? You really don't see a lot of coffee and don't not a lot of. Don't get me there. started on movie theater concessions because I think that they're they're terrible and they're like people keep trying to you know introduce different things. But God, I, I love snacks and there's so many snack categories that are not represented. What do you want? Combos? Why can't I get like hot cookies? I want some hot chocolate chip cookies. I feel like quesadillas are underappreciated. They're so finger happy and they're filling and they're like all the things that are in movie theaters like already. You got the cheese, you got chicken, you got tortillas. It's I mean, easy to make. It's quick. Why can't there be, why can't McDonald's have some kind of licensing deal with AMC where I can go get chicken nuggets or McDonald's french fries and watch the movie? Is it the smell? Is it, you know, some, like Arclight never like nachos because of the sound. We can't have the crunch. They get a crunch is a problem. Yeah. I see that with the quesadillas, a, a silent nacho. You guys are everything that's wrong with this generation. <laughs> You just want everything handed to you. Yes. Directly you handed want to Back me. in my day, we had to sneak McDonald's fries into the Why movie Why can't I get to a bag of Doritos it. at the movies? It's a movie. It's so loud. You go get your popcorn. You go get your soda. If you're lucky, you get a hot dog, and that's all you need. This is the movies. I you think eat auditory. popcorn, and you watch the... Audit, really? I, get, I think of what the quieter foods are. That's why I went quesadilla why instead of nachos. It, why, Doritos are too loud. Why gotta, is it the same candies, too? It's like, you know, the same five candies. Why can't Bunch I get of a, crunch are too loud. Why can't I get a take five bar or like a Milky Way af- midnight bar? Because I don't know. Back Licensing. in the day, Twizzlers and M&Ms were the first ones to figure out how to dance the Let's Go to the Lobby <laughs> song. Dance their way right in. The lobby. And they stayed. Oh. Uh, I think donuts and coffee are because it's the, those that are morning connotations. I think those are like an early, it's like a before 11 a.m. A lot of people don't go to the movies early enough. You guys are just, it, the, the Am chat I ever room. Thinking it? I would eat God. some donuts. I would definitely <laughs> eat some donuts. Look at this. I would eat donuts. Dunkin' Donuts is my favorite. Rick and Morris is making some sense here because this, because the smell is distracting. I agree. The smell would be distracting, but now y- you guys are winning over I, a lot of fans. I, Jesse Adkins <laughs> says, I want bacon and hash browns. Kenseth Ooh. One says, I'd go for tea and crumpets. Come, you're poisoning the youth. The smell um, is distracting. I sit next to John Roca for 40 <laughs> movies a year. Somebody get this kid some cologne. <laughs> All right. And with John Roca's bathing that. habits revealed, we will call it a day here on Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank my very intense panelists when it comes to their passion for food products served at movie theaters. Jeff Snyder. Jeff Snyder, where can all the kids find at you when in, you are not at the Buffalo Exchange? At the Inn Snyder. And Roca, I love you. Okay, You're that's, my boy, boy. Uh, kissing and makeup maybe a little too late. <laughs> Coy Jander, besides Collider Heroes, which will be on tomorrow right here on Collider Video, where else can the kids find you? Uh, Twitter and Instagram at Coy Jandro, and I think versatility in foods is an easier win. Like you get buffalo, you get your barbecue chicken. Why don't you just add toppings? It's right there. What? You already got the chicken. I'm just uh, now that I'm thinking about it. I just want these concessions people to know, okay, that when you order pretzel bites, it comes with cheese. You don't have to pay extra for cheese. Thank you. This foundation. This guy literally just asked for a McDonald's inside of a movie theater. It's, just, it's not an airport, Jeff. It's <laughs> I demand a terminal in every movie theater. How much a Big Mac would be at a movie theater? Seventeen dollars. Who is buying pizza at a movie theater? That's what I, I want to know. I ask the same question. Just get you get your popcorn, you get your soda, 
That's it. Pretzel bites. You wanted to eat something else, you should have gone to the, the <laughs> restaurant next door before you walked into the theater. That's how Mark Ellis lives. And you can find more of my nugget size life hacks <laughs> at Mark Ellis Live. And you can get tickets for upcoming stand-up shows like Chicago, April 12th at MarkEllisLive.com. Throw it to the Y to say goodbye. Tune in to Quiet Movie Talk tomorrow. Big announcement. And we'll see you guys then, 4 p.m. in the PT. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.